Better System Trader, Episode 10. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader Podcast, Episode 10. I'm your host, Andrew Swanscott. We have a ripper of an interview this week. Our guest began his career as a rocket scientist working on the navigation systems used in the Apollo missions. He's been involved in the market since 1971, and in that time has worked and consulted to a number of successful CTA, investment and prop trading groups, creating systematic trading and hedging programs for them. He has also published 13 books, with a new book due to be released in the coming weeks. Listen out at the end of the episode where I mention how you can win a signed copy of his new book. In today's chat we discuss market noise, the impact it has on trading styles, and how it can be used to determine which strategies suit a particular market. We also talk about price shocks, how to mitigate their effects, and how to use volatility in your favour. We also discuss how to use the information ratio for strategy performance and our guests outline some strategy ideas you can test yourself. We also have a new section in the program today where our special guest answers questions submitted by some of the listeners, so look out for those. Anyway, let's get to it. Today's guest is Perry Kaufman. Hope you enjoy it. Perry Kaufman, thanks for joining us today. I guess a lot of people are aware of your background story, but for those who aren't, can you please give us a a brief introduction to your background and how you uh, actually got started in trading? Uh, Brief brief is the difficult problem. (laughs) Uh, uh, I started started in aerospace. Most people must know that. I worked um, with a team of people on the navigation for Gemini, which for those people old enough was was the project that came before Apollo. We're all familiar with Apollo. But you have to develop the navigation for uh, for one vehicle uh, before it's actually used. So, so my background's in mathematics, and I did uh, reconnaissance work for the government afterwards, and, and then went into uh, computers. A couple of the fellows from the group broke off, and we formed our own computer company. Uh, And a couple of years into it, somebody came along with a problem in options. And these were London options in about 1970. And it was fascinating. And from there, we just seemed to stay there. Although we we moved to futures early on, because futures were seen fundamentally more interesting with with much higher leverage. And... um, and I just moved forward from there. I was in agri- I had an agricultural firm for some time where we hedged products. So I have a, a background in agriculture, and and uh, then we went into money management, developing systems, and that's what I've done ever since. I consulted to oil companies a great deal, and uh, and have developed. Uh, programs that are all algorithmic. I do want to stress that, that everything I do is algorithmic. Years ago, I did some discretionary trading. I found it very tiring. You know, you make money, you lose money. But but I find uh, systematic trading much easier to deal with. I, I'm good with the numbers. So I'm, I'm fine to let the probabilities work for themselves over time. So that's what I do. I develop programs. I'm sure you're all aware of that now. Well, I guess you've been trading for quite a while now. So you've uh, obviously experienced all types of market conditions. How have markets changed over the years? Oh, that it is a good question. Markets have changed a lot. I guess it's a combination of technology and participation. Technology obviously has speeded up things. People from all over the world can access the markets now. When I first started, it wasn't that way at all. Um, But the participation is much greater, particularly in the U.S., uh, where where everybody is invested in the market in one way or another, mostly in their retirement programs. And they pick 
they pick uh, funds to put their money into, and others just trade. Pretty active. And that trading has changed things so there's much more noise in the market than there used to be. When I first started in the early 70s, you could use a 10-day moving average and make money. It was just very simple. And it was simple until the early 80s. Uh, and, and as the markets became more active and more, more people joined and everybody has a, a different opinion or a different purpose, they take money in, they out, they put money in for, for different reasons, that adds this underlying noise to the market. Now, for a trend follower, that means it's harder to tell when the trend starts and when it stops because you have to wait till the move is big enough so that it's not considered noise. For the mean reversion trader, it's a little easier because it broadens the, the short-term area where they could make money doing the opposite of what the market's doing. And so I, I think that's the direction it's gone. The only other thing that's made it more difficult lately is that during a crisis, markets tend to move together much more often. That is, they all reverse together. Uh, the, the driving force is money flowing in and out of the market. In 2008, uh, everybody drew out money, which meant that those markets that were going up went down and those that were going down went up, which made it impossible to get any kind of diversification. So the fund managers uh, who normally can offset risk by spreading their positions across different assets uh, failed miserably because all of those assets responded to the flow of money. And I suspect that's going to happen in the future. People just get nervous at the first sign of, of a problem, almost, almost like when you hear that a big company is about to go under, everybody runs and takes their money out like a run on the bank. Mm. So, and that, that causes more problems than the underlying problem itself. So, so those are, those are the issues of technology participation and the way people act in a, in a crisis seems to be much different now than it was even 10 or 15 years ago. Okay, great. So just um, if we just go back to noise for a minute, I just want to check that when you talk about noise, you're not actually talking about volatility, are you? Uh, no, I'm just talking about erratic movement up and down in the market. So that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, or in the uh, early 70s, you could make money with a 10-day moving average because there wasn't so much participation. The markets moved very smoothly in one direction, smoothly because the markets were dominated mostly by commercial interests and very large traders. They didn't have the individual uh, participants. They didn't have the, the retirement funds. Uh, we actually, it, it could be interesting to the listeners that when a new market comes on board, like a, a country with a, a stock index, it is very easy to trade with a very short trend uh, program because they represent what our markets were in the 1960s and 70s. Very low participation, mostly commercials, and they tend to have very strong trends. And you can watch them as they get participation over a few years, they become not so easy to trade with the short-term trend. And you have to extend the period of your trend out a little to avoid the noise that's developing in that market. So if you rank all of the index markets in the world, you'll find that the US markets are the noisiest. And in this case, noisy I'm measuring with my efficiency ratio, which measures how much back and forth movement there is given the net change over time. So the US markets are the noisiest, uh, followed by most European and then Asian and South and Latin America, South America. So the markets that uh, are newer, less developed, 
less participation, we'll have stronger trends. Now, that's a useful piece of information because if you're developing a trading strategy or trying to decide how you trade them, the markets with the most noise are best traded as short-term mean reversion, and the markets with the least noise are trend following. So it, it can be very useful to, for defining your strategy. And, and just to qualify it, it doesn't mean that from time to time you won't get a good trend. Like our index markets, which are notoriously bad for trend following, were fabulous from 2009 up to last year. Uh, and, but, but they are not normally good. But, but every market has its period of trending and its period of non-trending. But in the big picture, the index markets are not good uh, for, for trend following programs. The best ones would be the short term interest rates, the longer interest rates, FX. I, I perceive these as driven mostly by Fed policy. So the long term trends are developed because of the way the Fed feeds in uh, interest rate changes, which tend to be very slow and over time which obviously affect the interest rate markets, secondarily affects FX because money flows to those markets with the highest rate net of inflation and political instability. And then lastly, to the, to the index markets, which are much more complex and reflect interest rates, but, but in a very complex way. So you, you touched on considering the level of market noise uh, to determine a trading style or market, but yes. are there other factors that you should consider when trying to decide on a, a style or market that that suits you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, my my wife is had, was a floor trader on the Chicago market for twenty five years, and she is no doubt a short term trader, uh, and she still trades, and she is always looking for the fast profit. Uh, we had a, uh, <clears throat> a time when we sat down and decided how we were going to position our uh, investment account, you know, whether we were going to buy uh, energy or health care, uh, a number of things, and, and hold those positions for a year. We thought that would be a nice horizon. And so we spent a couple of days figuring it out. She went up and she took all those positions in the market. And about three, four, five days later, she comes back down from her office and said, okay, I'm out. We made a profit. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the point is that we, we all have our trading personality. I'm okay with many different systems. I like to mix them. I like to have trend following as about 50% of my portfolio, some short-term trading on patterns and mean reversion as the rest. She's only a short-term trader. She can't change that. And, and so you have to find a system that matches your personality. You know, if you're a short-term trader, you cannot stand the, the equity swings that you get in a trend-following program. Long-term trend-following programs at the end of a trend can easily give back 15 or 20 percent of your profits. And that's part of the program. You have to, if you're going to do it, you have to expect that. But if you're a short-term trader, it'll drive you crazy. So, so I think you could use noise and you can study these systems, but ultimately you have to decide what your trading philosophy is and what you're comfortable with. So I guess for someone starting out, though, they wouldn't really have an understanding of their trading personality as yet. So what would you recommend that they do? Well, I always recommend trend following because trend following is absolutely the safest way to go. But, but I, I need to point out that trend following is long term. There, from my point of view, there, there are big moves in the short term. Uh, and they are driven by supply demand, by, by a number of different factors. But I consider the safest trends, the ones that I mentioned that were driven by Fed policy. And so 
to me, macro trends, and a macro trend we define as, say, anything above a 60-day calculation period, up to as much as 200. Uh, a macro trend is the safest way to go for people that start. It gives them a chance to get on the right side of the market. Uh, it doesn't have that many trades. They don't have to devote too much time to it. They can even do it on a weekly basis. Uh, you need to get familiar with the market and you need to put your money in it, even if it's a small amount. You can, you can trade stocks with a couple of thousand dollars, uh, but you need to see how the system reacts in real money if you're going to start to understand trading. So, so I would start with trend following. I'd start with uh, both stocks and some ETFs. I would, uh, and and by the way, you th this fr this touches on portfolio uh, or portfolio risk, but it's it's probably appropriate at the moment when you take when when you're trading more than one stock or more than one ETF or more than one anything. You always use what we call volatility parity. We try to uh, make the risk of every position that we take equal. Now, the easiest way in stocks, because you can't do much else, is simply to uh, trade the same amount of money for every stock and decide your position size by dividing by the price. It's not brilliant. If you keep away from the stocks that are under $5, there is a reasonably consistent relationship between price and volatility. I won't get into it because it's, can, it can be a little complicated. But, but the, the easiest way in the way I do it for my program is I simply take the, uh, a fixed investment like $10,000 per stock or $5,000 or $1,000 and I divide by the share price. And, and therefore, everything I'm trading has the same risk. When I do it in futures, by the way, like the S&P Mini, I actually divide by the real volatility, which is I, I do it with the 20-day average true range converted to, to dollars. So I take a nominal investment of, say, $25,000 for the S&P, and I divide that by the dollar value of the average true range, all right? And that's really volatility parity. The thing we do in stocks is not, but it's as close as we can get. Now, I want to point out that if you don't use this equal position sizing and you decide that, that one stock is going to make more money than another, then it better do that. Because once you trade a larger position in a stock that is more risk in a stock, if it doesn't make more money, then you're only adding risk to your portfolio. Personally, I, try, I, I have never had success in trying to predict how much profit I'm going to make on the next trade. I, I'm much better at predicting how much risk I have. But... But how much profit is a really tricky item. I mean, if I took the 10 highest ranking stocks by some ranking service, uh, would, would I be able to say that the top ranking one will make the most money next week or over the next couple of weeks compared to the third ranking one? I, I doubt that. Uh, I, I think that you, you get a bunch of stocks that you think will perform well. Uh, some of them have made more money, some less money, and you trade them equally to get diversification because you really don't know which one is going to perform best. So anyway, I think if you, if you take this equal risk approach as much as possible, you'll always be safe. Let me, let me just recommend, there was a book uh, written a couple of years ago called Inside the Black Box. Yep. And it's supposedly the inside story about how hedge funds do things. And he goes through a whole bunch of ways to allocate portfolios. 
you know, or to allocate the money into a portfolio. And he debunks everything except equal weighting. And he doesn't actually say that that equal risk weighting is the best, but it, but he says everything else is bad. So <laughs> so I, I leave you to draw a conclusion. I can also recommend my favorite book to um, the people listening in, and it's called The Logic of Failure. I don't know if you've heard it, Andrew. It's It was a German book published around 2001. Um, it's by a fellow named Dietrich Dörner, D-O-Umlaut R-N-E-R. It's interesting because they take, it, it's an exercise where they've taken some high level executives and they've given them hypothetically an African country that they're in charge of and they can do anything at all to it to improve the quality of life. And some of them dig deep wells for irrigation and grow crops and feed cattle and and do different things. And some of them, most of them are horrible failures. Uh, and they, they do this with a sophisticated model of, you know, if you do this, this will be the repercussions in three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And some of them are great successes. And the book doesn't conclude uh, why one is a failure and one is a success. Well, you can see the failures, but the successes aren't quite as clear. But you'll find it a mentally challenging book to draw a conclusion across all of the successes to see why they were a success. I think that it reflects greatly on traders. And I suggest that people read. It's a very short book, very easy to read. It's been translated into English from the German, and I suggest everybody read it. Yeah, thanks for that recommendation. I'll look that one up. Um, while we're talking about risk control, can we have a bit of a chat about price shocks? And by price shocks, I mean large changes in price caused by unexpected events. There's been a number of price shocks in the markets over the years, which can obviously have a huge impact on trading performance. However, the treatment of historical price shocks in testing can often be overlooked. So can you explain what are the impacts of price shocks on testing results and how they should actually be handled when backtesting? Oh, that's really a very good question. Yes, I'm afraid that many test results benefit from uh, taking advantage of price shocks. Obviously, we can't know what a price shock is going to do. Um, I, I can say in general, a price shock works against you, especially if you're a trend follower, because a price shock is due to a vacuum in buying or selling. And, and since most people in trends and stocks are long, the price shocks tend to be down and they tend to be severe. My wife loves these price shocks, by the way. This is <laughs> everything that a short term, that a, that a floor trader lives for are these, <laughs> are these really fast moves to the downside. Um, not that they're predictable, but she trades the downside all the time, uh, hoping that it's gonna turn into a price shock. But uh, yes, one of the problems is if you were to do a longer term test and you can easily isolate the price shocks by going through and by price shock, I mean one day price shocks, not things that develop like 2008 where the market starts falling off and it goes faster and faster, like also 1987. A price shock is, is a surprise event like, like uh, an election result that wasn't expected or, or uh, you know, Iran drops a nuclear bomb on India, that type of uh, event. Uh, if you can isolate these easily, by going through your system and marking all of those days that were three times, say three times and more, the uh, daily volatility based on the average volatility. Okay, so or or just trading range. You can do it with a trading range. Yep. And then if you go back to your system test and mark off those days, you'll find that 
you profited from a majority of those days, which is really impossible in real life. In real life, you would be lucky to profit from 30% of them. And if you look at the amount of money that they contributed, it can be substantial. So you could be deceived into thinking that your back tests were very good, mostly because of price shocks, uh, which, mm -hmm. which is not going to be good. And it's not good, not just because you wouldn't have made the profits that you see in your back test, but it underestimates the risk. Instead of those being profits, they should have been losses. And the losses define the risk. So you're going to go into a system thinking that you had less risk, which is could be disastrous. Mm -hmm. And and I would say is is probably true. Even people that don't go in because they're deceived about the performance underestimate how much money they need to trade to survive a price shock. So you have to be very careful about leveraging leveraging up because you think your performance is great. I, I guess the classic example is long-term capital, right. which uh, imploded in 1998, I think, because they had our, our two great Nobel, Nobel Prize winners uh, when they were um, helping out define the system, look back at the data and said, oh, we have these price shocks, but Obviously, they're never going to happen again. They were very specific. So we're going to remove this, these price shocks from the data. <laughs> and, and of course, they were right. Those price shocks will never happen again. But other price shocks will. And, and so because they removed it from the data, their, their profit, historic profitability was so smooth, they were able to convince the banks to lend them money, and they leveraged their system 50 to 1. So it didn't take didn't take much of a uh, adverse move to wipe them out. So they had like six or seven years of very nice performance. They started after one price shock that would have wiped them out, and they lasted until the next price shock, which did wipe them out. Uh, but until then, they had a glorious run. So the issue about price shocks is that they will always be price shocks. They will always be unpredictable. They will always be big. And you don't want to eliminate them from your history because they will tell you what risk to really expect. And then with regard to testing, as I said, uh, since you, th there are a couple of ways to mitigate these price shocks without having to go through and pick each profit or loss out and see whether it was a price shock. Um, you can use a wide range of parameters for your system so that if you're a trend follower and you've picked a 60-day trend because it performed the best, it probably benefited from price shocks. But if you pick a 30, uh, uh, 60, a 120, uh, you will find that the average of those three uh, is less susceptible to price shocks. Mm -hmm. And note, notice, that, uh, notice that when I gave you a sample, I, I doubled the time period to get a better sample. When you double the time period, uh, you are essentially using equal percentages and you get a better sample if you were to use moving averages of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, et cetera, you would find that the, the average is weighted heavily to the long end because the difference between a 90 and 100 day moving average is very small. The difference between a 10 and a 20 day moving average is very large. And so you're, you're weighting this heavily towards one end and thinking that you're, you're looking at an even distribution, but you're not. So whenever you're testing, you try to increase the calculation period by a percentage, even if it's like 1.2% each time or 1.5%, not equal days, because you get a distorted view of what works.
and it always looks as though the long end works. Now, the, uh, so aside from using a larger sample of multiple trends to avoid the price shock problem, you can be a faster trader. If I have like a three-day trade, which I'll discuss, and, and I'm in the market only 15% of the time or 20% of the time uh, during the year, then I've avoided 80% of the price shocks, which, which makes a big difference. So one of the advantages of short-term trading, if you can make money trading and you're in the market less often, then the advantage in both the use of capital and the avoiding a price shock can be very high. So short-term traders have a big advantage in that they are less likely to suffer these price shocks. However, you have to be prepared for a price shock from time to time, so you can't make believe it's not going to happen just because you've reduced your chances. That's some great information there, Perry. So thank you. Um, yes. I'd, just, I'd just like to uh, change the topics a little bit to uh, monitoring system performance or uh, degradation. So as mm -hmm. markets change, strategies move in and out of profitability. How do you monitor the performance or health of a system? Well, you seem to only have difficult questions here. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, that's a question that people are still dealing with. Um, the simple, let me give you a couple of simple, simpler answers to that. Um, every manager has to monitor the performance. Unfortunately, using probabilities, you can take a fairly big drawdown and still, and still think that you're in profile for your historic performance. Obviously, you start with historic performance to get an idea of of what the pattern is, um, how much money you should make, what kind of drawdown, what kind of risk you have. Um, and you create, uh, I always create an information ratio, which is the annualized returns divided by the annualized standard deviation. Two pretty simple calculations. Anyone can look them up. And that gives you the information ratio. Uh, so, <clears throat> If you have done a, a robust system, you should be able to get an information ratio between one and one and a half. If you get an information ratio above three, chances are you've overfit your historic data. You know, the systems can only be so good. I have had a system in the 1990s, a short-term trend following system, that actually had a real ratio of three over eight years. And of course, we sold that to ED and F man at a big profit. However, the markets are much more difficult now. They were really easy. The markets went straight up in the 90s. We benefited from that. Um, a ratio greater than three is a little unrealistic. It's possible. When you get a ratio of four or more, it's absolutely not possible. And so I would suggest that anyone that gets information ratios that high should reassess what they're doing. Um, in reality, let's say I start with an information ratio of two, um, and that's in sample, my tested stuff. In real trading, uh, or an out of, I'm sorry, an out of sample. So now let's say I want to paper trade it for some time. I would expect that ratio to drop from two to one. And the reason it drops is that there are new patterns. You're now looking at patterns you have never seen before in slightly different ways than history. And, the, and your program just doesn't respond as well to those, even though it will make money. And the fact that it makes money is good. If it drops from two to one, you consider it a success. So, so don't be scared off by that. It's just reality. It's in statistics, as you add data, you're going to have longer runs of profits, longer runs of losses. It's just like, you know, coin flipping. The more coin flips you have, the longer the runs. It's all still random. 
So, so we have um, a degradation from two to one without a sample. Now, when you actually start trading, you could expect more degradation because now you have costs and slippage that you probably haven't accounted for correctly. And so you could expect that to slip down to 0.75. Again, that's a very successful outcome because the stock market is down around 0.3. So if you're at 0.75, you are really very competitive. So you have to understand the numbers to know what's good and what's bad. And then you have to be able to accept the risks with the risk that goes along with it. Because a 0.7 ratio means that there are some pretty decent swings in performance. And it's just part of trading. In trading, you have to learn to embrace the risk of your system. You can't eliminate the risk. You know, you can't go back over a system and say, oh, look at that trade, that was a bad trade. Uh, I can fix that by changing this parameter or adding a different type of stop loss or something. That doesn't work. You have to have a robust system. And I think the phrase that I like to use for that is loose pants fit everyone. <laughs> if you have a system with very few parameters, it's a kind of has sloppy performance, but it works and gives you profits on most markets. Um, and then you reduce the risk by diversification. That is the correct outcome. If you try to hone in on the profits and eliminate the risk, you're just kidding yourself. You eliminate the risk in one place, it pops up somewhere else. It's just not possible. So I would, I would uh, seriously suggest that if you come up with a system that is profitable and you add a parameter to it and it improves it, but it doesn't improve it gigantically and it doesn't improve it across all markets, don't use it. You need something that's robust. The few things that are robust, long-term trend following, uh, some patterns, volatility, you may find that, and you probably will find that trading, when the volatility is very high, has more risk than it does reward. When the volatility is very low, uh, the market can be going nowhere. So you'll find that volatility uh, regimes identify certain characteristics in markets that are very interesting. And if you don't mind me babbling just a little further. Not sure. Uh, <laughs> when it comes to this volatility, one of the interesting aspects is if you eliminate the extremely low volatility, which means markets do nothing, and um, you find that, uh, that in low volatility, trend following systems make the most money. That is lower than average volatility. The problem is it also makes the, it, that is it makes the most consistent returns, although the returns are lower because the market's making smaller profits and losses each day. It is important if you're trading futures, for example, or the S&P, to leverage up when the volatility is low. You need, uh, the professional managers have what they call the target volatility, somewhere between 12 and 16% which is measured as a standard deviation of the daily profits and losses. When the volatility falls down under 12%, say to 10 or 8%, they gear up by raising the size of their position, increasing the size of their position to bring volatility back up to 12%. If you don't do that, you tremendously underperform your expectations. So there's a lot of money to be made in these lower than average uh, of volatility periods. On the other side, as I mentioned, when the volatility is very high, you're much better getting out. And so when I measure volatility and I use, say, a 20-day uh, annualized volatility calculation, which is the same as they use in options, 
Um, you'll have to look it up. I don't want to quote it over, over the phone here. When the volatility of, let's say, the S&P goes over uh, 45, 40 to 50, you want to get out. All of a sudden, the risk becomes greater than the reward. And, and while you may like participating in that type of market, you'll find in the long run, it's a mistake. And, and, and I can't tell you for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if price shocks became more frequent at those higher volatility levels. Maybe a different type of price shock. Anyway, that's, that's my, my overview of price shocks. Again, more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> if I can just um, ask you an easy question now to finish up before we get to the listener questions. Um, it will require a crystal ball though. If you take into consideration the changes of market behavior in the past, where do you see trading moving towards in the future? Ooh, that is uh, difficult. I, I think there will be more liquidity and more noise. I think that trend followers will still profit, but they won't profit as much because, as I said, it it is uh, takes you longer to identify when to get in, when to get out. So there's less left at the end. I still like it. I think there are always opportunities. I have avoided um, intraday trading in the last uh, 10 years because I think there are enough daily opportunities. But there are more mean reversion in index markets. Um, unfortunately, I think the only outcome that I can see in the future is more correlation. And more correlation makes it much more difficult to, uh, to get diversification. So I would advise people to strongly consider different strategies um, more than they worry about what markets they're trading. The markets are going to move together, but if you have a mean reversion strategy and a trend strategy and some pattern strategies, you can still keep diversification even when the markets move together. So I would concentrate on having three different strategies. The magic numbers are three and four. After four, um, you lose the benefit, the greatest benefit of more diversification into strategies. So just try to come up with three or four uh, different approaches to the market. And I think that will help you survive the future. And of course, as we said, you have to monitor it to make sure we're not decaying. Right. So I've got so many more questions I'd like to ask, but let's uh, okay. just hand some over to the listeners. I've got a couple here that they've submitted. The first one is from Larry P. My question is for Perry Kaufman whether we're trend trading or swing trading and mean reversion trading each system would benefit from a stable reliable measure of signal to noise i remember about 20 years ago reading his book smarter trading and was very excited when reading about the efficiency ratio uh, it hasn't been the holy grail that i was looking for but i was wondering in all your years of testing and creating indicators and systems since then if perhaps some improvements or advice uh, concerning a signal to noise ratio measure has come across his path. Yes, thank you for that question. I I do like um, the efficiency ratio, and I'm first. I mentioned that I use it to judge the amount of noise in a market, which then tells me whether I want to trade it as a trending market or a mean reverting market. Now, it's unfortunate that I can't use it in everyday trading. Um, I did use it to develop a smart execution uh, approach some years ago, which said if there was noise in the market, I'd wait for a better price. And if there was no noise in the market over the short term, I would enter quickly. Uh, it, it is not a holy grail, unfortunately. It doesn't include volatility. It normalizes volatility. So you could use volatility as another dimension. But unfortunately, um, it it's works best as a long-term trend following 
approach. I had originally developed it uh, for very short-term reaction, trying to use as few days as possible to give me a longer view of the trend so I could be in faster. Uh, I've discovered over the years that it's actually better in a longer term view. And in that, um, you know, when you use 40 or 60 days as the period instead of 8 or 10, it outperforms any one longer term moving average, which is nice. But it's still, it's still a trend system and it's still a longer term trend system and it's still going to have, um, it's still going to have swings that are typical of a trend system. So that's the only advice I can give you with regard to that, um, to use it to decide on your strategy and perhaps to switch to a longer term method. I, I have heard from people that said they were very successful using it in short term trading. Uh, my wife uses it for short term trading, but she's a discretionary trader and she looks at it and makes a decision off the screen rather than I, uh, a systematic order. I, I'm sure somebody can figure it out. I haven't done better than what I've just said. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Perry. So the next question is from, I think it's Ola. Apologies if I've mispronounced your name, Ola. Uh, the question is, I'd like to have Perry's views on the changing profitability of classical technical analysis. Trading is evolving very rapidly and it has become harder to maintain profitability of strategies based on classical uh, technical analysis. It seems useful time frames are getting shorter, signal to noise ratios are decreasing, competition from algorithmic trading is getting fiercer. Is the only way forward to do the same thing, that is, go for short term algorithmic trading? Well, I think uh, the perception is correct. All those points are correct. Uh, in what's happening to the market. But, you know, there there's always opportunity. So let me give you a little short-term system that works very nicely for index markets. Um, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, Taylor. Uh, in the 1950s, George Douglas Taylor came up with a three-day cycle system. And it said... If the market goes up two days in a row on the, and opens higher the third day, you sell it on the open and you hold it um, one additional day. So if you sell it on Wednesday, you exit on Thursday on the close. If uh, the market goes up two days in a row, does not open higher, but closes higher, you sell the close and you then exit the next day on the close. So uh, you have either a close to close trade or an open to the next day close. That system still works brilliantly for the index markets. You don't want to use it on individual stocks because stocks have their own patterns. They're more erratic. It, it's a big number issue. These patterns can form nicely if they're well traded. I have looked at those recently, and they work very nicely for uh, the S&P or the Spiders, uh, SPY, the Qs, IWM. Um, you should try that. Uh, somebody should try that. It's an opportunity. I also am just working on volume spikes, and I'm going to put these up on my website at some point soon. Um, a volume spike is when the volume of the day is at least twice the average volume. And there has been a, um, a, a direction, notable direction in the last week. So that the volume spike represents uh, a change of direction, a mean reverting change. And I have found that if you take advantage of a volume spike in stocks, individual stocks, as well as futures, it seems to work across the board, um, and you're buying from the spike, the spike occurs and the trend had been down, 
uh, you want to hold that trade for about four days. If you're selling on a volume spike, you want to hold it for about three days. Again, it's an interesting change. It's a different way of looking at the market. I also have uh, something on key reversals, uh, which I it I don't know if anyone knows. I have a website called KaufmanSignals.com where I where we sell trading signals for three different strategies, and each month I put up a kind of a little research report. And if you want to go there, you don't even have to sign up as a member or anything. We don't need to know your name. But you can read these reports each month. We, we discuss portfolios. We discuss different patterns in the market, all things that could improve your trading. And this month, I'm going to discuss key reversals, which, again, are good if you put them in perspective. If the reversal is big enough, if the outside day is big enough, if, if there's a preceding trend. So, so all I can say is um, that there are opportunities and, and they're still here. They're, they're not 100% trades like every other trading system. They, they have their periods of profits and losses, but over the long term, they do very well. They will make money. Again, and you, when you mix those pattern programs in with your trend following program, you gain that diversification that I'm talking about that will protect you against price shocks. And, and I think all that's extremely important. Thanks a lot for those strategies, uh, Perry. I, I know what I'll be doing tonight. I'll be testing those out. <laughs> yes. Um, next uh, question is from Ryan. What trading methodology and market type best suits the use of fractal geometry, i.e. trend trading versus mean reversion, equity versus FX, etc.? I'm not quite clear about that. Um, um, fractal geometry is interesting. You must... No, of course, Edgar Peters wrote a lot about that. Um, he didn't actually turn it into a system, at least not that he's published. Um, I don't really have anything. I do recommend that, that people look at John Eller's works. By the way, I'm, I'm a fan of John Eller's. Uh, let me just, as another aside, uh, to keep everybody busy at their computers, John Ellers uh, has produced a number of indicators recently, one of which I found fabulous, and it's called a roofing filter. It's in one of his latest books. I can't really tell you which, but I'm sure if you type into the internet roofing filter, you'll find it. Um, it transforms uh, data into cycles and you then take that transformed data and stick it into a stochastic uh, momentum indicator. And what it does is it smooths it out tremendously with, with virtually no lag. I know it sounds like the ultimate indicator. Uh, I've used it in a number of programs very nicely. It, it really outperforms any other momentum indicator I've ever seen. And the nice thing is, is it goes from zero to 100. So you can use buy and sells or indicators at five or 10 versus 90 or 95. He has a new one that was just published, I think in technical analysis, stocks and commodities, which is called the universal oscillator. And he likes it even more, but the problem is it's not bounded. By that, I mean, it doesn't go from zero to 100. And therefore, it's, it's difficult to figure out where you're overbought and where you're oversold is, except by when it turns and from up to down, down to up, which is more complicated. I'd rather be a seller as, as it goes up into the high range rather than waiting until it turns and comes down. So I'll stick with the roofing filter for now. But he has a lot of stuff and he may address fractal geometry. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, other than conceptually, uh, the idea is whether a particular pattern works in different time frames. So, so if something is truly fractal, 
it would work with 15 minute data, with hourly data, with daily data, with weekly data. I haven't found that to be generally true because there's more and more noise as you get to higher frequency data. So 15 minute data has more noise than daily or weekly data. And that changes the characteristic of the system. So that's my best answer. It's not probably the answer you want, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> well, we've actually got a second question from Ryan here. What, if any, experience does Perry have with short-term trading, either the Hang Seng or the Nikkei futures? Specifically, are these markets mean reverting or trending? Is there better profit opportunity in the overnight or the day time frame? Ah, another interesting question. Actually, I just got back from Hong Kong where I made a presentation using their markets because it's only fair that in Hong Kong you'd want to trade Hong Kong markets. Um, I found that, that um, their markets are more re mean reverting than ours. So in this three-day system, which does work, the three-day trade that I gave you before um, actually works for Hang Seng, so I suggest you try that. Uh, it, uh, you, it also works instead of a three-day trade if it's a two-day trade. So, so one day up, the second day is up again. On the open, you sell that. Uh, because the market's noisier, which means it's going to turn more often. I thought that was interesting. Uh, so anyone interested in looking at the Hang Seng Index might want to apply this and, and note how fast the market changes direction. Uh, but, but my tendency is to trade all markets with the same pattern. That's Remember, I like robustness. And I'm willing to not have the best system because I'm not going to overfit and trade every market differently. I'd much rather trade all of them with the same, with the same rules. I, I just feel more comfortable doing that. It, it moves me away from, from overfitting, which I think is the biggest problem we have given all the tools we have uh, to, uh, you know, to analyze the markets. We tend to overdo it. Um, and, and that's something you all have to learn if you're going to be successful. Anyway, so that's uh, my experience. Nikkei, um, I don't remember having the same luck with uh, Nikkei or with uh, uh, the Straits Times, but, but this three-day trade uh, would apply to equity index markets. So, so I would try them I would try them anyway. I, I just can't remember enough to tell you that they were good or bad. Okay, thanks, Perry. Uh, the next question is from Adam, and he asks, what do you think about high-frequency trading and the impacts it has on market behavior? How can we avoid or handle the effects of uh, high-frequency trading? Uh, well, I, I understand why that's a concern to everybody. Um, if high frequency trading is, is uh, successful, it extracts a small amount of profit from everybody. Uh, I think it operates, since it operates in milliseconds, I think it adds liquidity to the market at a small cost to everybody, including me. Uh, however, I'm not sure high frequency trading is as profitable as it used to be. Just like program trading in the stock market, you know, where people would uh, buy futures and uh, or or sell futures and buy buy the S and P when when they diverged, uh, that's become more and more competitive. So it's almost not even a profit center anymore. It just happens. People have to take positions sooner than they want to to get in ahead of everybody else, which reduces the profitability. And at some point, that profitability is so small, it becomes marginal. I think that's what's happening in high frequency trading. There are people doing it. There are people profitable, but the profits have been small. I know of companies that have stopped doing it because it's too competitive. 
in any event, I think I, I would rather have high fre frequency trading in the market because when I go to place an order, I believe that I can steal positions from those people. They don't care at all, and I get their executions. So, so I'm I'm not going to worry about it. You know, a, a fraction of a cent that they're looking for doesn't bother me when I'm looking for a much bigger profit over a couple of days. Okay, thanks, Perry. And the final question is from Jim, and Jim asks. Can you recommend a simple end of day only mechanical mean reversion based strategy for next day trading S&P 500 uh, long short? I think that says I use Ridex open ended mutual funds as vehicles and I'm limited to end of day only trades. I've looked at various methods for buying into oversold pullbacks, but I've not found a strategy that is very next uh, next trading focused with a good success rate. Any thoughts or advice is sincerely appreciated. Well, here we have the same answer as before. I f it's this three-day trade that works very, very nicely for, for the U.S. index markets. Um, I've already given you those items. Uh, but you specifically said RIDEX. Now, I have had less success with RIDEX when, when I... Um, when I study the performance of SPY, for example, the sector spiders, and um, the futures, which my code would be ES, I find the performance quite similar. When I do write X, I don't find it as similar. Um, and I don't know why. It should track very closely. When I've looked at the percentage change, it seems very close. Um, I, so I can tell you, I can only suggest it is this, this um, is a problem for Ridex because Ridex doesn't post the open. It, I don't think it allows you to trade the open. I'm, I'm not sure. They were starting to do something where they posted prices more than once a day. Um, you could try this system uh, basis only the close so that uh, one of the two rules was was that if the market opened higher, if the market was higher two days in a row on the third day, you would sell the open, a higher open, or sell a higher close. Um, an open that was lower and then a higher close. You could track the spider or the S&P for that pattern and then sell or buy Ridex on the close and hold for one day. Um, it should work uh, if you're able to test the spider and Ridex, and it doesn't track closely, then Ridex is a problem. And I don't know if it's a problem in cost or in, um, it's just something that I can't put my finger on. But, but I'd say if it tracks, you should be able to do that, but you'll only be able to execute on the close. <clears throat> And it should be okay because I think those trades over time were very good performers. And I think that's my best choice. It, you could, uh, I'm going, as I said, I'm going to post these key reversals and volume on my website sometime very soon. They are also close only trading and they hold for, for one to five days. So you could keep your eyes open for those, and that would also give you an opportunity. Okay, sure. Thanks. Um, so if we can just wrap up with a few uh, quick closing questions. What's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Uh, probably people won't like it, but it's accepting risk. It's, it's having enough money to absorb swings and once, once I'm happy with a program, as I am with the ones that I trade, um, I don't worry about losses. I'm going to give the program a lot of latitude because these losing periods happen all the time. You have to just become sort of immune to these, accept them as part of um, your trading. 
And to do that, you have to be capitalized enough. So you can't start trading with all your money or with money that you can't afford to lose because you'd never be able to survive the risk of these programs. And the programs all have risk. So, so that's my, my best advice. It's, it's a long-term learning process to accept risk, but, but it's necessary to be successful. And what's the best trading advice you've ever received? <laughs> um, what is the best trading advice I've ever received? Um, good question. Um, this week I'm going to publish a new book. I'm going to self-publish for a change. It's called The Algorithmic Trader. It'll go up on Amazon. Uh, it should be ready within a couple of days. And it actually covers all of the things I've learned in developing a trading system over the last, I won't tell you how many years. And, and they do probably cover the points that, that your listeners are interested in. It's not going to be an expensive book. I think it will be available both in softback and as an ebook. But, but perhaps you'll find the answers there. Uh, an inexpensive way to get a lot of advice. Okay, thanks. You've already mentioned actually a couple of books, but do you have a favorite trading book? I mean, other than my own? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've uh, this the Algorithmic Trader, is that your 12th or 13th book that you've released now? It's actually, yes, the 14th. The 14th, wow. I know, it's scary, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I thought you promised your wife you wouldn't make it write any more books. I did. But you know what <laughs> happened? This book developed because I I do make presentations. And it turns out when I talk about things like uh, a, a trading system, I also talk about position management, sizing the position, how to test it, how to test a system. And I found that the um, participants were more interested in those side issues than they were in the underlying system. And and I don't blame them. It's it's an issue of teaching them to fish, you know, rather than giving them a specific system, teaching them how to create their own system correctly. And so they like that. And I just came home and I took all my notes and I wrote them up and expanded them with examples and it became a book. It's only a hundred pages long, but it's full of stuff. It doesn't tell you what the markets are all about. If you don't know, you just shouldn't be reading it. And, uh, and, and I think it's packed with information. So, so it, it, it wasn't a painful process like my big book, which even takes a year of steady work just to revise. So what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Oh, sure. Um, I, it, they can do it through my website, um, which is uh, Perry at perrykaufman.com. I'm sure you can figure out how to spell that. That's It's the easiest way. I answer all questions. It's no problem. Uh, and I usually answer them fairly promptly until you ask questions like, give me the best system you've ever known. Uh, I'm not going to answer a question like that. <laughs> uh, but, but if you have a technical issue or, or a serious question, I always answer them seriously. And, and so I'm, I'm happy to share um, advice, but I do like them written down. I don't want phone calls so that I can answer them as, as clearly as possible. And you can phrase them as clearly as possible. Okay. Thanks so much for your time today, Perry. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? I don't think so. You can all take a look at my website, kaufmansignals.com and read those, uh, white papers that you'll find um, in one of the drop-down menus. I think you'll find them very helpful. Um, other than that, I hope everybody develops their own systems. I think that developing a system is very important because you understand it and you can embrace it and you, you know what's right and what's wrong about it. And so I'm, I'm a real fan and I will support questions when it comes to trying to manage your own money like that. I think it's great stuff. So thank you all for uh, 
listening to me. I'm sorry this has dragged on so long, but but I hope you get value, value out of it. No, that's great. And I'd also like to add that um, anyone who hasn't uh, read your book, Trading System and Method, uh, really should. It's um, it's massive. It's like the encyclopedia of trading, but it's uh, it's got so much valuable content and ideas in it. So I can't uh, recommend that book highly enough. And we look forward to uh, reading The Algorithmic Trader when it comes out very soon. So thanks a lot for your time today, uh, Perry. Really appreciate um, uh, all that you've done for us. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Bye. Bye-bye. So much great info from Perry today, wasn't there? Here are a few points that stood out to me. Noise in the market indicates the type of strategy that will work best. So trend following is suited to markets with low noise and mean reversion for markets with high noise. So with the US markets being the most noisy, you may want to consider mean reversion strategies and if you're trading in a, a newer market, which tends to trend more, then uh, trend following may be a better choice. I also uh, found the information ratio quite interesting in how to use it to measure strategy performance and detect possible overfitting. So Perry said a robust system should be able to get an information ratio between 1 and 1.5. But if it's over three, then you may have overfit to historical data. So that's a pretty simple measure to determine if you should look at um, you possibly curve fit your system. I really enjoyed his comment, loose pants fits everyone too, when talking about a robust system. Let me just read the statement that he made. If you have a system with very few parameters, it kind of has a sloppy performance, but it works. And it gives you profits on most markets. And then you reduce the risk by diversification. That is the correct outcome. If you try to hone in on the profits and eliminate the risks, you're just kidding yourself. You eliminate the risk in one place, it pops up somewhere else. So I thought that was great advice. Now for the bonus this week, to celebrate the upcoming launch of his new book, Perry has kindly offered a signed copy for one lucky listener. All you have to do is go to the show notes page for this episode, which can be accessed by going to bettersystemtrader.com slash 10 and click the big blue button to enter the draw. The draw will be open until Sunday the 14th of June. Uh, Perry will choose a winner from the email submitted and will announce the winner. So good luck to all those that enter. Now you may also remember that last week we had a competition to win Gary Antonacci's book, Dual Momentum Investing. Gary has chosen a winner from the list of those that entered. So for the person who has an email address starting with A-N-I-R, Congratulations, you're the winner. I've just sent you an email, so please reply with your postal address and we'll organise for Gary to send you a personally signed copy. For those that didn't win, I highly recommend you pick up a copy of the book anyway. I think it's only 40 bucks, but it's a great book and the content in it is worth so much more than that. So check out the show notes page for episode 9. I have a link to the book there. Before I go, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to all the listeners who submitted questions for Perry. If you'd like to submit a question for future guests, then look out for the emails I send uh, to the mailing list. I'll let you know who the guest is and a link to a page where you can submit your own questions. So that's it for this session. I hope you enjoyed uh, the chat with Perry Kaufman this week. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader and I'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.